Are we ready? Set to go. Um, I uh, want to take the opportunity, I guess, to tell you guys today about um, a, uh, an idea that uh, is really um, something that was surprising as I was writing the book that you guys have for your textbook. It's uh, something that came out of the equations that I was describing. And um, it, the book didn't start out with this idea, but as I was writing the equations, I realized there was something interesting in them and it was worth thinking about, which is really the beginning of this uh, idea that links the way individuals consider time in the way they make decisions, potentially in how they make movements. And the story of it is a, is a, is a little bit of a personal story. So when I was a kid, um, I lived in uh, a, an apartment in Tehran, and um, my parents uh, would go out for walks in the evening. Most parents do that, you know, when they live in a city, it's, your apartment is small and you want to get away from the kids, so they would go out for walks. And um, my mom would often would come back kind of frustrated at the fact that my dad would walk so fast. So my dad was a fast walker, and my mom was not a fast walker. And um, when I began to study motor control, I thought it was interesting why was it that some people were just fast in the way they spoke, and um, I wondered whether those individuals also were fast in how they walked, and maybe they were also fast in their reaching movements, and maybe their eye movements were fast as well. I didn't know the answer to that, and we still don't know the answer to that, but it was interesting to me that I had met throughout my career people who just were like vigorous in the way they moved, meaning that when they spoke, when they walked, they just were fast walkers. And it was like, why? Why do they walk so fast? What's so special about this way of walking than you know, other ways? And if you look at the literature on locomotion and control of movements, people who study biomechanics, they, they imagine that um, there's some energetic cost associated with movements. And that energetic cost is somehow something that our brain would care about. So if you wanted to move in some way that would be least effortful, then um, the you would tend to have a particular pattern. But if that was true, then it wasn't clear to me why did my dad walk so fast? I mean, like, did he not care about energetics as much as other people do? What was the relationship here? That was one aspect of the story. Then there was this other aspect of the story that had to do with diseases that affect the brain. So, you know, there are some diseases that make, make individuals just move slowly, like Parkinson's disease. It just seems to have very little to do with energetics. It seems like why would they not care about energy of their movements like other people do? or care more about it than other people do. That wasn't very clear. So when I was writing the book, I got to this chapter which uh, describes um, costs of movements. And what I'm going to show you is that our understanding about what kind of costs there are in movements was missing, in my view at least, a critical component. And that, that's, the, that's the concept of time and how time discounts reward, meaning that you make movements in order to acquire a rewarding state, but that rewarding state is more valuable if it is arrived at sooner rather than later. So if we play with the mathematics, we'll see that discounting of reward will affect the vigor of movements, meaning that if your brain discounts reward more steeply than my brain, then the theory says that you should move in general faster than me as well as make decisions based on reward and time that are more impulsive than me. So this led to the hypothesis that maybe the way people move is in some way a reflection of how the brain represents reward and the cost of time in those rewards. So that's what today's lecture is going to be about. We're going to set up the mathematical problem of this cost function. I'm going to show you what the um, standard way of thinking about it was until about the year 2009 or so. And then how that changed with this idea that there may be a cost of time that describes things. But to, to motivate our behavior, we need to have an action that we're going to be studying. We need to have some data. And that data that we're going to look at are the simplest of all movements, which are saccades, how you move your eye from here to here. And if you look at saccades, there is a regularity in how movements are taking place. So we're going to do chapter 10 today. So 
saccades are movements of your eye. So when you move your eye from this location to this location, if you look at the time and how it relates to velocity and displacement, it looks something like this. So time is on the x-axis, and if this from here to here is something like maybe 15 degrees of motion of your eye, what your eyes will do is that you have a velocity profile that looks like this, where it ends at around um, you know, 40 milliseconds or so. Maybe, or the, and, and has a velocity of about, say, 400 degrees per second. So this is what a typical movement looks like. If you look at parameters like duration in terms of milliseconds versus amplitude, what one sees is that as, as saccades go from small to large, 70 degrees, the duration increases and then it kind of grows a little faster than linearly as uh, amplitude increases. And these milliseconds are, this is on the order of about 200 milliseconds. This is what the typical data looks like. And um, until really, I mean, to be honest with you, until I began thinking about this stuff, if you looked at the literature, you saw that it, it, people had noticed that there are some people who have fast saccades and some people who have slow saccades, but it wasn't really something that was of interest because oftentimes what happens is that the data is available to tell you there's something interesting there, but unless there's a theory that says here's why there's something interesting there, nobody pays any attention to it. Let me give you an example. So when scientists were looking at the flowers and animals that lived on the western coast of Africa, they noticed that there's a great similarity to the flowers and animals and fossils that exist on the eastern coast of South America. And in fact, if you look at the map, it really looks like those two things could fit in there. So there was no question there was data that suggested that these two things some long time ago used to be close to each other. But, you know, how can you move a continent across water? You know, what kind of force could push that? Because there's no theory that tells you that Here's a way that these two things can separate. The evidence that suggests that they used to be neighbors is irrelevant. So unless there's a theory that tells you that there is a way to explain the data, the data is, you know, by itself doesn't mean anything. It just, it just sits there. Um, as an aside, I'll tell you a story. So when Galileo described this theory that the sun is at the center of our solar system, the primary problem that he had was really with people who were other scientists and they asked, if that's true, what kind of force is out there that moves this planet Earth with all its mass across the heavens? Who's pushing the Earth? So his problem wasn't so much with the fact that here's data that says it fits this theory better. His problem was with the fact that he didn't have force as a function of gravity. He couldn't provide you with an answer of how the Earth is moving around the Sun. So what did he say? Is that, well, God in all its wisdom has found a way to move the Earth around the Sun. And in fact, Tycho Brahe, who was the prominent physicist at the time, said, well, really the way things work is that here is here's Earth in the center of our solar system. Out here, there is the sun, and everything else goes around the sun, and then the sun goes around the Earth. And in his theory, much of the data fits, because it doesn't matter if the sun goes around the Earth or Earth goes around the sun, and he had the advantage of these are heavenly bodies. I don't need force to push them around. This is a real rock. We know that is no heavenly body. And so, if you can't tell me the force that's going to push it around, it better be stationary. Okay. So data by itself often means nothing unless there's a theory that provides a framework to explain it. And that's really been the history of science. All right. So let's go back to our observations. So it turns out that if you look at some people, when they make these saccades, some people do it like this, and some people do it like this. Okay, And this data had been around for a while, but um, no theory to say, okay, wh why? Where does this come from? So the major idea 
regarding cost functions and how they can be used to explain movements came in 1997 or 8 or something like that. It was a paper that appeared in Nature. And the way it described the cost of movement was based on the notion that the reason why you move is because you want to get accurately to the destination. So in that theory, what mattered was the variance of your movements. So the idea was, let's say I don't know why your 15 degree saccade takes 40 milliseconds. I don't know why. But what I'm going to assume is that I have 40 milliseconds to make a movement. What's the best movement that I can make? So here's the idea that's asking if this is, if this is 40 milliseconds to make an eye movement, should I have a velocity that looks like this, or should I have a velocity that looks like this, or something else? So why is it that velocity, not something else? So suppose that God made your brain so that you could only make 40 millisecond long 15 degree saccades. If that's the case, why do you make a saccade that has a particular profile like it does? So the cost that was suggested is that if you make your motor commands so that they produce a velocity that looks like this, at the end of your movement, you will have the minimum variance that you could have. The variance of your movements will be as small as possible. So the cost that was suggested is as follows. J is going to be equal to variance of x, position of your eyes, at the end of your movement, p, it's going to minimize this function where this is end of movement, x is state of your eye. And for now, let's assume that state just means position. In a little while, we'll make it a little bit more interesting. So we're going to minimize the endpoint variance. And now, for this to happen, there also needs to be a constraint. And that constraint is that the expected value of x at time point p is going to be equal to our goal, g. So meaning that I don't just want to have an endpoint variance. I actually want to have a mean that's centered at where I'm supposed to go. right? So OK, I have a cost function, and I have a constraint. This is my cost. This is my constraint. I want to minimize the cost given the constraint. So in the class of functions that we're going to be considering, we have the i, and the i is moving. And fortunately for us, the i is really well represented as a linear system. And it looks like this. And I'll show you how to derive the linear system. But for now, let's suppose that, we, that, I, that I have shown it to you that indeed x at time point n plus delta is equal to a times x and time point n plus vector b times the motor command u of n. But then these motor commands have some noise associated with it, epsilon u of n plus an epsilon x. And the characteristics of these noises are as follows. Epsilon u is normally distributed with mean 0 variance k squared u squared, and epsilon x is normal variance 0, uh, sorry, a mean 0 and variance sigma squared. So the signal dependent noise appears in epsilon u. So the noise in this equation, this part of the equation, depends on the motor commands. OK. So the idea of that paper was that if you have a system in which the noise depends on the magnitude of the motor commands, that's going to influence the variance of your endpoint. So the idea is to find u star, the best motor commands that are minimizing j, this cost, given the constraint that the expected value of x at the end of my movement was equal to my goal. So, well, to do this, what we need to know is that what is the variance at the end of the movement? And then once I know that variance, I'm going to have to show you how do you solve a cost minimization problem that's, uh, that's uh, 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 dependent on a constraint. So the nature of our problem is as follows. 
we're going to find the motor commands that minimize endpoint variance given this constraint. Okay? Yeah. But do we know all those parameters? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's what's nice about people that worked in the field of ocular motor control. They had measured these parameters. What that paper did is to say, let's assume there is a signal-dependent noise. And if we made this assumption and put this number in there associated with how much noise there is, then indeed it turns out that minimizing this function gives you a velocity profile that is like this, has this, has this form to it. So that was the, the big idea of that paper, that minimizing endpoint variance is something special about it because it seems, to ex it seems to produce the kinds of movements that people do. Now, it didn't produce you know, this concept of uh, why is it there are differences between pole and why is it that you should have only 40 milliseconds, you should make it, why shouldn't you move it 45 milliseconds, what's different than that, but we're going to get to that in a while. But first what I want to show you is how do you in principle solve these kinds of problems, constraint minimization problems in which um, uh, you have a cost and you have a constraint. So to, to show you how to do that, let me, let me solve a simpler problem for you. Suppose you have the following problem. There's a line described by the function y is equal to mx plus b. And there is a point here identified by x0, y0. And what I want to know is that where is the point on this line that is closest to this point, x0, y0. Okay? So to do that, I want to show it to you in terms of a cost and a constraint. So clearly our point, x, x and y, x, y is the point that I'm looking for. It must belong to the following constraint, y minus mx minus b is equal to zero. So it has to, it, when you, if you give me x, y, it has to be in the line. So it, that's my constraint. The cost that I want to minimize is one that says, find the distance between x and x0, y and y0, and minimize this cost, minimize this distance. Right, so what that means is that there is a circle that represents my cost that's equal cost away from my data point. And what I'm looking for is the point where my circle really is going to touch that line. That point where it touches it is the point where I'm minimizing the cost given the constraint. So what Lagrange did is to represent this problem in terms geometrically in terms of the normals to these functions. And he's, he came up with the term that we use now, it's called a Lagrange multiplier. And what we're going to do, we're going to change our cost function, j, so that it incorporates the constraint that we have. And so when we minimize the cost function, we're also meeting the constraint. And we're going to do it using this concept of a Lagrange multiplier. So what's his idea? What's Lagrange's idea? Lagrange says that what you need to do is notice that there is a vector that's perpendicular to a constraint. So here, here, here's the, here are these vectors. These vectors are all perpendicular to my constraint, normal to the constraint. And there's also vectors that are normal to your cost. So here, here they are. There's also this point out there. There's one place where the vector associated with the constraint is parallel with the vector associated with the normal to the cost. So let's write down these, these quantities. So this is j. Sorry, this is j, my cost. And there's a vector that I can describe, dj, dx, dj, dy. And this is equal to 2x minus x0. 2y minus y0. And similarly, I can describe the vector associated with my constraint, normal to the constraint. Let me call the constraint function g. Don't, don't confuse this with the goal up there. 
This is a function. It's a function of x and y. So dg dx dg dy dg dx is minus m dg dy is 1. That's this function. It's derivative with respect to x and y. And the point that we're looking for is the one that has the following property dj dx dj dy is equal to lambda times dg dx dg dy and g of x and y is equal to 0. So if you look at what I just wrote, I wrote three equations with three unknowns. dg dx is 2 times x minus x0 is equal to lambda times minus m. The unknowns here are x, y, and lambda. Right? That's what I'm trying to find. I want to find x and y, and I've introduced a new unknown, lambda. So I have two equations that I have here. I have three unknowns, x, y, and lambda. But here's my third equation, y minus mx minus b is equal to 0. So I have three equations, three unknowns. I can find x, y, and lambda that meet this constraint. Okay, So what he's doing is, is the following. He's saying that you have a cost, j, that's equal to x minus x0 squared plus y minus y0 squared. You have a constraint, g. Say that you write your cost in the following form, in the augmented form. j a is equal to the, the old cost as before plus lambda times g. So if I write this like this, the minimum dja dx dja dy is equal to 2 times x minus x0 plus the derivative of this, this, this um, uh, uh, dg dx hmm, I don't know if I should do it this way Let me don't do it in, in that form. Let me write it in vector form. So dja with respect to the vector x, where x is equal to xy. That's equal to dj dx plus lambda dg dx. And what we do is that we, we find the x that minimizes, um, uh, we set this equal to 0, right? So to minimize this cost, we find this derivative with respect to x, and we set it equal to 0, which means that we have dj dx is equal to minus lambda dg dx. And if you look at what I did here, that's what this is. So if I just take my cost and augment it as follows, then effectively what I'm doing is setting the normals associated with the cost function and the constraint equal to each other with an unknown called a Lagrange multiplier lambda. And how do I find that lambda? Here I have whatever number of unknowns I have, two unknowns. I have three unknowns here because I have a lambda. I have two equations. My third equation is going to be the one that I get from g of x and y is equal to 0. So I get three equations, three unknowns. In principle, if you have a constraint that's not just a scalar function, so this is a scalar function. 
if I have a vector function that's a constraint, then what I do is that when I want to write my um, uh, cost function, the way I write it is as follows. I write it as follows. So I say j augmented is equal to j plus lambda transpose the, the constraint. So you may have a constraint that's not just one line. You have to meet many constraints. In that case, you have a vector. And so what you have now is you have as many Lagrange multipliers as you have constraints. Yeah? Can you repeat or, uh, the, in the geometric interpretation yeah. why the solution is where those normal vectors line up? So I have two solutions, right? I have it here. And I have it here as well, right? They're collinear. They could be anywhere on this, on this circle, and there's two places. But the only place. Uh, but then the constraint makes it so that there's only one place, on the line. On, which is on the line. Yeah. Um, I guess it's the that I sure. Why the um, the uh, normal? Yeah. So the normal is just saying you know, show me the vector that's perpendicular to your function at any point x, y. That's what this is. That's the equation for the normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess it's like why um, that is the solution. Yeah. I, so, so you know, this I have also a normal here, right? Right. But this not this is not a solution, right? Because of the third equation. Okay. Right. So you have anywhere you have a normal that's in the same that that's collinear with the normal to the line, you have a potential solution. The tiebreaker is the fact that that point has to belong to the line. Okay. okay. Maybe the question was why being collinear. Why collinear? Yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, Some yeah. Some would say it does not matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think it was because of um, derivatives are being easy to find, and that's the geometric meaning of a derivative. It's that it's perpendicular. But um, I mean, you could have any point that I mean, you, so you know, um, I suppose you could have it perpendicular. Right, um, but I don't know. Um, that wouldn't work. So, so the, the thing to keep in mind is that this the the norm that we are considering that makes it perpendicular to the um, to the cost function gives us any point along this this line here. But the point that matters is the one that also belongs to the line, which is what the third the third equation gives us. All right, so let me now get back to our original problem, minimizing the endpoint variance. So this is what we had up here. Yeah, yeah, sure. Which one? Yeah. It, it, only, it only changes what lambda is, whether it's going to be, you know, if whatever you call lambda, if it has a minus in front of it, then you just your lambda is going to be negative of that. Okay. So it's, yeah. like it's just a constant. Different yeah, 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 right. You're right. This is different. This lambda is different than this lambda because it has a minus on it. But you just find that when you, when you solve the equation, you find the value for it. I sure, no problem. No problem. Um, if you're constrained, Yes. If that line crossed the same circle twice. Yes. Um, what would happen in that case with our multiplier? So uh, like, like well, it and, and it does, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's fine. That's fine. So something like this, sure. right? That's g of x, right? So that this is g of x y mm -hmm. is equal to zero. That's that's the equation for this. Right. And and so now we have. You know, something like this, right? So it is possible that I'm going to get 
two points that have minimum cost. And what this means is that this is going to be a quadratic equation or some function that has multiple solutions. That won't give me one. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, you don't have enough constraints now. Okay. It all just works out. On that. Well, it, it, it means that you're going to have not three linear equations. You're going to have two linear equations and a quadratic equation. Okay. Which in which case, in which case gives you multiple seconds. Yeah. yeah. Right. But in principle, if you have constraints that are many equations, so this is just one equation. If I have constraint that is many equations, like I wrote over there, where G is not just one equation, but like five equations, then what you have is you have to meet five constraints simultaneously. And the way you do it is by writing your cost function so that the Lagrange multiplier becomes a vector. And you just have vector times that. The, 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 the result is the same. You're going to get a solution that minimizes the cost meeting those constraints. All right, I want to go back now to our original problem. I want to find a way to minimize this cost function given this constraint. Okay, so let's see how we can do that. So first, let's write down the, the physics of our problem. So typically what we would have is that we have something that looks like this. So force produces a displacement. And if you're talking about a movement of the eye, that's angular displacement. So x is like theta um, that you're considering. Now, um, this is force that's produced by some muscle. And you can imagine that a very simple muscle model might be as follows. Um, DF dt, say alpha 1, plus alpha 2 times F is equal to U. Well, this is the input that you give to that muscle. This is the force that it would produce. And that force moves the system. And this is a low-pass filter, which is typical of a muscle. If you give it a bang, it gradually produces that force. So it's a differential equation describing the low-pass relationship between input to the force that the muscle produces. And then we have the physics of the eye. If you produce this force, here's how it's going to move. mx double dot plus bx dot plus kx is equal to the force. OK, so this is a, the dynamics of our system. Now, the first step is, how do we go from continuous time, which is what I wrote, to discrete time, which is what I've, we've been talking about? So this is continuous time, right? And we need to go to discrete time. So let's first write our problem in terms of a state space model in continuous time. So let me, let me uh, um, uh, solve the equations here. So I have x double dot is equal to f 1 over m minus um, 1 over m b over m x dot minus k over m x. And um, then I have the relationship between uh, f and uh, uh, df dt. So I have df dt is equal to um, 1 over alpha 1 times u minus alpha 2 over alpha 1 times f. So um, suppose that I define x1 to be x, x2 to be x dot, x3 to be force. These are my, how I'm going to define my state, state vector. And um, if I want to write now the following, the state update equation, x dot, x double dot, f dot, this is going to be equal to some matrix times x, x dot, f, plus some vector times u. I'm going to take my, these two equations and write them as a um, you know, canonical state space model. So x dot is equal to 0, 1, 0 times this. x double dot is equal to minus k over m minus b over m and 1 over m times, times this. And then f dot 
here's f dot, is equal to 0, 0, minus alpha 2 over alpha 1 times f, plus 0, 0, 1 over alpha 1 times u. Okay. This is third order dynamics that are being described by an input u to a low pass filter model of a muscle that moves an eye that has second order dynamics. Okay, so how do I now write this in discrete time? Let's call this vector x A continuous, this is going to be a matrix, I'm going to call it A in continuous time, times x of t plus B in continuous time times u of t. So what's x dot? That's equal to x at time t plus delta minus x at time t divided by delta, right? And if delta, uh, the approximately, this is not equal, but you know, almost equal, right? So I just wrote the, that using um, rectangular differentiation, I can define something very close to x dot as being the difference between x at time t plus d, uh, delta minus x at time t divided by delta. So if that's true, then what I have is that uh, x dot of t times delta, that's the time that I, uh, that I have in my discrete time, that's going to be equal to x of t plus delta minus x of t. So x of t plus delta is equal to um, x dot of t times delta plus x of t which means that x of t plus delta is equal to, what's x dot? That's a continuous times um, x of t plus um, times uh, b continuous times u of t, the whole thing times delta plus x of t, which is equal to a continuous plus delta, um, sorry, plus identity matrix times delta times x of t plus b continuous times delta times u of t. So delta is just a scalar, just a number that tells you how big is your step in discrete time. And a continuous is what we just had before. This is called A discrete. This is called B discrete. because a delta plus i quantity of x t. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Good. Okay, so given our model in, in, in continuous time, we can write the equation in discrete time. All right, so let's go now back to here. This is discrete time version of that model. So delta here is just time, some, some small amount of time and space. All right, so now what we're going to do is um, write the variance of this equation. 
And to do that, I am going to, uh, let me do it here. So what I have is, <coughs> excuse me, I have the following issue. I have, um, I don't know if you can see this. Let me clean this. Okay, so what we're going to do is write the um, variance at the endpoint as a function of all the motor commands we've given at the from the beginning to the end. And to do that, what we need to know is how does the variance change as a function of the motor commands. So, let's see. Oh, this was the my pen. All right. So I have. x at time point 1 is equal to a times x at time point 0 plus b times x at, uh, at time point 0 plus epsilon u at time point 0 plus epsilon x at time point 0. x at time point 2 is equal to a times x at time point 1 plus b u at time point 1 plus epsilon u plus epsilon x, which is equal to a squared at time point zero, plus a times b u zero plus epsilon u zero, plus a times epsilon x at time point zero, plus b times u at time point one, plus e u at one, plus e x at one. So, in principle, I can write my x at time point p, the final time point in which a movement takes place, is equal to a raised to the power p, x at time point 0, plus sum of k going from 0 to p minus 1, a raised to the power of p minus 1 minus k, times uh, b times uh, u of k, plus epsilon u of k plus um, um, a raised to the power p minus 1 minus k epsilon x of k. Let me check to see if I did that right. I guess I can just put this inside the parentheses. Uh, no. The B's need to go inside. Yeah. Okay. So what do we mean when we say variance of X of P? The only noise terms here are epsilon U and epsilon K. Sorry, epsilon X. So I have sum k is equal to 0 to p minus 1. Um, the, let me bring, so this noise here, epsilon u, has uh, mean 0 variance k squared u squared. This is mean 0 variance sigma squared. So I get k squared u of k quantity squared times a p minus 1 minus k times b times this quantity transpose b t a p minus 1 minus k quantity transpose plus some 
same sum times um, the noise there, which is sigma squared times a p minus one minus k, a p minus one minus k transpose. Let's see if that's right. Yep. Okay. So um, x, however, is a vector, right? x is a vector. It's a three-dimensional vector. So what I'm really interested in is the variance of the position, not the variance of velocity or variance of acceleration. So what I'm really interested in is not variance of x. I'm interested in variance of s transpose x at time p, where s is just a selector 1, 0, 0. I'm just inter interested in the position. I'm interested in the variance of you know, where you are, not the variance of your velocity or your acceleration, just the variance of position. So what this means is that the variance of s transpose xp, variance of position, is just going to have, when I have s transpose times this, what it does is that it takes the um, s's inside this matrix. So um, what I get is uh, basically, let's see, um, I get the sum times k squared u of k squared. Then I get s transpose a um, p minus 1 minus k b b transpose a times um, s plus um, s times um, um, sigma squared times a p min minus k transpose a transpose times s. So it's just a selector. When, the, when, it, when there's a selector matrix that acts on it, it just adds an s transpose here, s here, s transpose here, s here, making these a scalar quantity. That's the variance. OK. So I also have a constraint. My constraint is the expected value. So my constraint is that the expected value of um, x at time point p should be equal to this goal. And what that goal is is that you know, I should be at some location g with zero velocity and you know, uh, zero acceleration, change in force. So I'm going to have three constraints. And what is the expected value of x of p? Well, I have the equation for x of p. It's there. This expected value is going to be equal to um, a raised to the power of, of p times x0 plus um, the sum k is equal to 0 to p minus 1 a p minus 1 minus k times um, b times u of k. That's it. The rest of them have expected value of 0. So that should be equal to this. This is my constraint. I have three equations here. This is my cost. I have one equation. It's a scalar quantity. So what I want to do is write my problem as follows. Ja, the augmented cost function, is equal to the variance of s transpose x at time point p, endpoint variance, plus lambda transpose times my expected value function here um, minus g, minus this, this goal here. That's going to be my, my constraint is this minus this should be 0, right? That's my constraint. That for this to be equal to this, this minus this has to be 0, which is the expected value of, um, of x point p minus g0, 0, 0 is my constraint. That's my augmented cost. Yeah. Are the A's and phases being a lot more the same as A, B, and B? And yes. So with that selector, is that just, I mean, maybe I have my 
matrix algorithm. But is that um, is that taking the first element in that A matrix squared? Um. Like the upper left. What it does to A is much more complicated. I, I don't have a. I don't have a. Um, I don't see precisely what All it right, does to A. Right. Yeah. S transpose A will pull out the first row of A. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Right. All right. Sorry. Yeah, Excuse go ahead. It's like substitute S transpose times X into the equation up there and then take the variance of it and it just falls through algebraically. I was actually looking at the um, the last the sigma squared S transpose A mm -hmm. uh, A transpose. A transpose. Mm -hmm. Zero? No. It won't, it won't, why would it be zero? Uh, oh, it definitely won't be zero. Okay. Okay. No, no. It, it's a, it's squaring it. Yeah. So so what that says is that um, that this noise here, this noise, is is growing as as k increases. Because the longer this this goes on, the more you're going to get this noise that's associated with the uh, with with this x. Right, that's an exponent, not an index. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, um, yeah, yeah. This is not an index. This is being yeah, raised yeah, to yeah. a power. Okay. Right, yeah, right. Like Indexes are in, s in parentheses. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Good. Good. Okay. So, all right. Let's come back to our cost. Here's our cost. And we, we added our Lagrange multiplier times our constraint here, right? So now what we're going to do is to find the derivative of our cost with respect to the motor command u that we're looking for. So we're looking for this, right? Arg min u of j, given this constraint. And we said that we can do this by finding u star is going to be equal to arg min u of j augmented, this augmented j that I wrote over there. So I'm going to minimize this function with respect to u. So what does that mean? So I have a cost that's a function of u. And what I need to do is find the derivative of that function with respect to the vector u. So u runs from x0, from time 0, to time p. Oh man, this blackboard is, this whiteboard is in bad shape. Hmm. All right, so what we're going to do is find the derivative with respect to uh, with respect to u. Let's see what do I mean by that. Um, we have we have this this function here, this sum, and I want to find the derivative of this with respect to the vector u. Where what I mean by the vector u is as follows. So d j a du. What that means is derivative of ja with respect to u0, derivative of ja with respect to u1, du
time point P, set that equal to zero, and I have my constraint, which is um, the expected value of x of S, um, time point P minus G zero zero is equal to zero. So um, this is going to give me three equations. This is going to give me P equations. Right? How many unknowns do I have? So my unknowns is u0, up, and lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, the three Lagrange multipliers. These are my three unknowns plus the u's. So I, I just got p plus 1 equations here. I have three more equations here. I have enough equations to find all of them. All right. So just to give you a sense of what this means, okay. So let's let's look at let's look at this equation. What is what is the derivative of our um, augmented cost with respect to u zero? Well, u zero appears in only one location, the first element. So the derivative with respect to u zero is going to be two times k squared times u at time point zero times this plus this derivative with respect to, so write lambda t times this. So the derivative of this with respect to u0, which is going to be um, lambda transpose times this times u0. So just one more time. The derivative of ja with respect to u0 is the derivative of this with respect to u0, which is going to be 2 times u0 times k squared times this. The derivative of the second term with respect to u0 is going to be lambda transpose times a to the p minus 1 minus k times b times u0, th times b, no more u0s. And k0 in the exponent of a? Yes. Well, exponent of a is going to be a times p minus 1. k is equal to 0. That, yeah, right. Yeah. a raised to the power of p minus 1. So the first equation there, let, let, me, let me just write it down. This term here. Um, it's going to be 2 times u0 k squared. Oh, I'm so sorry. I. I'm using, uh, this is stupid here. So this k, of course, is very different than this k, right? This is, a, this is an index. This k inside of that is referring to the noise of, the, of epsilon u. Sorry about that. The one is kappa, the other one is k. I apologize for that dumbness. All right, so this is going to be s transpose a raised to the power of p minus 1, b, b transpose a raised to the power of p minus 1 transpose times s plus lambda transpose times a raised to p minus 1 b. That's equal to 0. That's our first equation. I'm going to get p more equations just like this. And in addition to that, I'm going to have three equations here. So I have as many equations as I have unknowns, I can find all the u's, I can find all the Lagrange multipliers, that gives me u star, the motor commands that minimize that cost. So when you do that, you get the, the optimum motor commands, and what this says is that for p, some duration of a movement, you have optimum u star in the sense that it minimizes endpoint variance. OK? And then in that paper, in the whatever, 1999 or 2000 paper, what they found was that if they introduced this signal dependent noise that had some value to it, then indeed, if you had assumed a duration of p 
to make your movement and you generated those motor commands you star, you got a velocity profile that looked like the real thing. It had the shape and so forth of the real thing. So that suggested that maybe one of the costs that's being minimized is endpoint variance. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense because you don't want to just get to the target, you want to get to it in such a way that you maximize the probability of getting there. So you want to be as accurate as possible. You want to not just have this mean of your distribution, but also as small of a variance as possible. So this is basically saying you generate a movement in such a way that you maximize the probability of success. How do you maximize it? By minimizing the variance of your movement. All right. But the problem with this formulation is as follows. If I want to minimize variance, why don't I just increase the amount of time that it takes to get there? Because what happens is that the, the shorter time you have, the more vigorous motor commands you have to produce, the stronger your input has to be. So if you really want to get there by maximizing the probability of success, why not just go there slowly? So what happens is that if you increase p to p prime, of course your velocities are going to get smaller, right? Because you have to follow the same distance. But now, if you look at the variability that you have at the end of your movement, this cost, it falls. So if you look at duration and you plot the variance at time point p. So as p increases, the optimum variance is going to decline. Why is that? Because signal dependent noise. Because look, to get there quickly, you're going to have to generate a heck of a lot of u. Right? When you generate u, you are going to increase variance, because variance depends on u squared. It's going to penalize tremendously the vari variability. So if you want to get there sooner, you have to generate a large motor command. The greater the motor command, the greater the variance. Right? All right. So here was the puzzle. It's interesting that people take 40 milliseconds to make a you know, 10 degree saccade, but if they took 15 mil, if, if they took a little bit longer, 50, 45 milliseconds, they would have even a lower variance. Why don't they choose 45 milliseconds? So that was the idea. All right, that's the puzzle that, that I want to tell you about. So the interesting thing about the way individuals make movements is that if you look at how a movement is made, it turns out that if people are asked to make a saccadic movement to a dot of space, in, in space, they do something like this, but if you ask them to make a movement to something more interesting, say a face, here's what they do. They make a saccade that's just a little bit faster. This is a saccade made to a face, this is a saccade made to a dot. And what this means is that Potentially, a face is something a little bit more interesting for me to look at than just a dot. And the reason why I can say that is because if you show people a number of stimuli on the screen and you look to see where do they look at first, faces are particularly attractive, which is why when people advertise things, they put faces there, particularly faces of females. So they attract attention. What that says is that your brain values that stimulus a little bit higher than other stimuli. But the critical point is that if you value something more, you will move more vigorously toward it. So that's the critical idea. That you don't just move, but you move because there's some reward there. The greater the reward associated with it, the more you're willing to spend energy. So the this is, seems like such an obvious thing when you think about it. Basically, if you, know, you have your girlfriend across the street or your boyfriend across the street and you're madly in love, you're going to move more rapidly toward them to say hello than if it's your mortal enemy. You know, it's just no question about this. So reward influences vigor. And something as simple as a saccade 
is indeed the case that people make more vigorous movements with their eyes if that stimulus that they are going to be looking at is more valuable to them. So it's not just minimizing endpoint variance. So endpoint variance is interesting, but this duration isn't really fixed. In a single individual, reward alters the vigor, but perhaps more interestingly, across people, some people just move with faster saccades and some people move with slower saccades. So what's going on there? All right, so if we believe that vigor, which means the motor commands we generate, minimizes a cost, then we need to have potentially a cost of time. What's good about you know, making a movement that ends in 40 milliseconds, and what's better? Why, why is that better than making a 45 millisecond movement? So basically what I'm saying is that if variance drops like this, why is it that I choose this particular duration, not this one? Potentially, because there's something that says, you know, things are getting worse. There's some other cost that is, that is increasing. And my thought was that maybe this is cost of reward. That it is better to get this reward sooner than it is later. So suppose that there are two kinds of costs. You're making a movement because there is something good to be had, so you want to get there with low variance. But two, it's good to get it sooner rather than later. Okay. So what do we know about time and reward? It turns out that economists, psychologists, for 50 years have been studying this question of time and reward. Now, we're talking about milliseconds here, but they have been studying it using experiments that go like this. You come to the lab and you sit in front of these computer screens or cards, and in the card it says, which one would you prefer? A thousand dollars in five years, four hundred dollars today. Which one would you prefer? Four hundred dollars today or a thousand dollars in five years? Four hundred bucks today. What if I give you three hundred dollars today versus a thousand dollars in five years? You would pick 300 bucks. What if I give you a dollar today versus $1,000 in five years? Okay, so there is a point at which for you, $1,000 in five years is equal to X today, right? Okay, so what psychologists and economists discovered is that if you look at the function, it looks like this. This is time, and say I'm gonna give you $1,000 in five years, this is equal to you to some amount today. And for most people, this is on the order of $350. Okay. And they said that it's interesting because if you fit these functions to the way people make decisions about these hypothetical things about money, that it looks like the value of some, some amount discounted as a function of time, t, is equal to alpha 1 plus beta times t. This is called hyperbolic discounting. So it says that you're taking something that's valued $1,000 today and you're saying that if it comes to me in five years, it's going to be worth a lot less than it is today. And that less has a metric to it. It's a hyperbola that's discounting it. So this is interesting because you notice they're not exponentially discounting. Exponentially discounting of reward is something that one sees in certain forms of mathematical formulations of learning, like reinforcement learning. If you look at theories that describe how machines should make decisions about reward, Mathematics of those mechanisms is based on exponential discounting. And this is an empir empirical result that comes from psychology and economics that says people seem to um, discount money based on hyperbolas. And what the, effectively what that means is that if you look at an exponential versus a hyperbolic, an exponential would fall to something lower as time goes on than a hyperbola. But there's something actually much more interesting about this that has to do with the concept of change of mind. Why is it that people change their mind? 
Let me show you what that means. So what I want to do now is compare for you a hyperbolic discounter like this function versus a function that discounts like an exponential. So let me give this following example to you. Suppose that on Friday morning, um, you're looking at your calendar and you notice that you have a test on Monday. So Friday morning, you, you, you're told you're going to have a test on Monday. So it matters to you to pass your test. So you plan that, OK, I'm going to study during this weekend. So passing your test is going to have some value to you, and you're going to plan based on that. That morning, your friend comes to you and say, you know, on Saturday, Saturday night, we have this plan to go out, going to go dancing. And so you, that has a value to you as well. And you compare these two things. Pass my test on Monday morning, go out dancing Saturday night. You decide, I'm going to study. You tell your friend no. Then Saturday night comes, your friend calls you up again. We're going to go dancing. Are you coming? Ugh. OK, I'm coming. You change your mind. What happened? So if you think about it in terms of decision making with these kinds of discount functions, it goes like this. So here's Friday morning. Here's Monday. And here's Saturday. So you're looking down the road and you're saying, ah, passing my test. It's great. I would love to do it. It has some value to you today. And you also like you know, this idea of going dancing. And you know, this dancing also has some value to you, maybe something like this. This is also discounted. So Friday morning, you look down the road. And to you, passing your test is more valuable than going dancing. But as time passes, this crosses. Now, this change of mind cannot be explained with exponential discounting. Why? Because in an exponential discounter, if the rates are the same, if all that changes is the value, because all I've done here is change the value. In an exponential discounter, these lines are going to be basically parallel. So if this is going to be more than this here, it's also going to be more than this here. So an exponential discounter couldn't explain why a person changes their mind, whereas a hyperbolic discounter can. So this is just some you know, anecdotal evidence for this notion of a hyperbolic discount. So, When we come to the problem of optimal control and generating movements, we see that minimizing variance by itself doesn't explain why there's a duration. So suppose that in addition to minimizing variance, we have this other cost that says there's a cost of time. And that cost rises the longer time it takes to produce that movement. And that cost is going to have a particular shape to it. Suppose that it is a hyperbolic cost, meaning that the longer it takes to do something, it's going to cost you more. But it's not going to you know, be any arbitrary shape. Let's suppose that it belongs to these hyperbolic functions. So this function is going to have a shape that looks like this. Uh, let's see, what should I erase? terrible. So suppose that I have a cost that says minimize my variance at time point p, my end of my movement, but it's also going to cost you some cost of time as a function of this distance p. And this cost of time is going to be equal to how much reward is there, alpha, times 1 minus 1 over 1 plus beta times p. So this cost here is going to rise. And if alpha is greater, which means that this thing is valuable to me, this cost is going to rise faster. If this value is less to me, it's going to rise slower. And beta tells me effectively how impulsive am I, how time discounts reward. So I have two things now in my cost function. I have how valuable the thing is for me. Is this really an important thing for me to get? In which case, I want to get there sooner. Or is that I don't really care about it so much, I can move slow. And second, in principle, how does time discount reward? 
and that has to do with beta, which is saying if I am a sharp discounter, which means that if for me $1,000 in five years is worth $3 today, sorry, is worth almost nothing today, something that is falls very quickly, then I'm an impulsive person. I, I can't wait. I gotta have it now. Maybe I'm on cocaine and I cannot wait any longer. I have to have what is it what I'm looking for today. So you see, the point is that the theory says that there's gonna be a cost of time and that cost of time should have a particular shape. This is the assumptions that comes into the theory. Right, okay. So now, if there is this cost of time, what we can do is to now ask, can we explain why movements have a particular duration? Not just why do they have the same shape, but why do they have a particular duration? And more importantly, we can say, is there a way to understand why there are differences between people and how they move? So that's the beginnings of this theory. And so when there are, def when there are changes that occur to individuals because of, you know, drugs that they're taking, uh, because of condition that they're in, these diseases that affected them, that changes that cost of time in decision making, does it also cause changes in time in how they move? And now we have a sense of how to link control of movements across domain. So that person that talks fast, according to this theory, should have this cost function that would influence everything that they do, not just their talking and how they walk, and how do whatever they do. And that's the basis of this, this idea. So we have two kinds of costs. We have a cost associated with you know, generating success. We want to get there, and then we have this cost of time. Okay, and so in the papers and so forth that were written in the, in the last few years, uh, we've tried to sort of solidify and test this theory. Now, let me, let me end with a, with a simple thing. Why should there be a hyperbolic cost of time anyway. Where does this come from? Why is it that people discount money hyperbolically? And why is it that when you look at movements, this hyperbolic cost of time seems to work particularly? Where does this come from? And why hyperbolic? So that has to do with the following idea. That if I ask you to compare some amount of reward, alpha one, and I tell you that I'm gonna to have to make you wait the amount delta, and I'm going to say compare that to a, amount alpha 2 given to you at time delta plus t. So I say compare $350 today, $350 at delta delay versus $1,000 at some longer amount of time. So when I say that, okay, let's find the condition where these two things are equal. Um, suppose that what you're doing is finding the rate of reward, which is reward by unit of time. Suppose what you're comparing is not reward, but the rate of reward. So if that's the case, then what I, when I find the time t in which for you these two things are equal, what's happening is that you're saying the rate of reward is equal in these two conditions, which says that um, alpha 1 is equal to alpha 2 times delta plus delta plus t, which says alpha 1 is equal to alpha 2 times 1 plus delta minus 1 times t. This is hyperbolic discounting. So if the way you make decisions is based on rate of reward, what's the rate of reward? It's reward per unit of time. Then it, you will appear to me as an experimenter as somebody who discounts reward hyperbolically. So when I ask you to do this, if what you were doing in your head was to compare rate of rewards, then it, you will appear to me to be a hyperbolic discounter. So this leads to the idea that rate of reward may be the fundamental unit of cost, and that by our actions, perhaps what we're trying to do is maximize not reward, but rate of reward. So we don't want just to be, you know, getting something good. We just want to get it all the time. The more you get, the better. The rate is what matters. And so in the experiments that followed, we tried to dissociate between reward and rate of reward. And you, you do that by having inner trial intervals. So you don't, you don't just look at one action. You look at the rate of reward, which means that you change how long people have to wait for things. 
And it turns out that as you change the inner trial interval, how long people have to wait, even though for every movement they get the same reward, if the rate of reward changes, people will change the vigor of their movements. And the vigor, the speed by which they move, depends on this rate of reward. <coughs> Let me stop and uh, ask you if you have any questions. Okay. All right. See you guys Monday.